We are in a series working our way through the book of Esther, and if you're just joining us now, you are in for a good time, I think, because this is where all the action really starts. Chapter 6 starts with these words, on that night, on that night, which night? That's the question, isn't it? On that night, on that night, after the feast that Esther had had for the king and for Haman, on that night when we thought that she was going to plead for the lives of the Jews, but didn't. On that night when Haman left the palace so thrilled with excitement and joy that he'd been honored to have this feast with the king and the queen. On that night when he left with joy, but then saw Mordecai, his arch enemy, and just blew his top. He was so enraged. On that night when he gathered all his friends and his wife together and said, what are we going to do to get rid of this guy, Mordecai, on that night? when he bragged about how he had everything in the world going for him, but none of it mattered because he hated Mordecai so much. On that night, when his friends told him, this is what you do, you build a gallows 75 feet high and you kill him tonight and then go to breakfast tomorrow with the king and queen. On that night, when he had those gallows built, on that night, that's the night we're talking about. On that night, it says in chapter six, the king could not sleep. That's the night. That's the night. The king could not sleep. He's tossing and turning. He is checking his Facebook account. He's drinking warm milk. He's counting sheep. He's doing his taxes because he just cannot sleep at all. On that night, the king couldn't sleep. It says this, so he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. This wasn't just any book. This was a special book all about the king. It was his favorite book. It had all in there, all of his best things, his accomplishments, the things he'd done, things he'd built, things that other kings and queens and people had done for him. He said, go ahead, grab that book and read it to me. I love that story. And then maybe I'll be able to fall asleep. And as they're reading, they just so happen to grab the volume of the book and turn to the chapter, the page, the paragraph in the book that talks about how five years earlier, a man by the name of Mordecai had rescued the king from an assassination attempt. That was at the end of chapter 2. At the end of chapter 2, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate, heard about these two servants who were going to kill the king. And he'd let the queen know, who let the king know, and saved his life. And so as they read that, then the king asks this question, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the answer is nothing. We didn't do anything for that guy. Normally when you did something good for the king, you would be rewarded, especially if you saved his life, because he'd want everyone on his side, right? So the bigger the thing you've done, the bigger a celebration, the, the bigger gift you should be given by the king to encourage other people to look after the king as well. Nothing. Mordecai saved your life. We didn't do a thing for him. We didn't give him a golden watch. We didn't have him over for dinner. We didn't give him a high five. Not a single thing. And so now the king's awake. And he says, we've got to do something for him right now. And he asks this, now who's in the court? Which of my subjects, which of my servants, which of my wise men is around here that I can get some advice for them? And so they go and look and it says, now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Haman's there for a totally different reason, right? He's there to have Mordecai hung. The king's looking for someone to honor Mordecai. The king's men go back and say, Haman's there standing in the court, and the king said, let him come in. And then we just see this incredible collision of ideas, right? Haman wants to kill him. King wants to honor him. Very different ideas, very different things that they want to do, but all for the very same guy. And I can just imagine as Haman shows up there, he's excited. King, I'm glad that you called me in. I'm actually here tonight because I have a pretty exciting plan I want to talk to you about. I've got this idea. King, I've got it all worked out. I've done all the hard work. You just have to say yes, and I'll go do it, and then I'll see you at lunch tomorrow for the feast, and this is going to be so good. Hold on. Did you want to ask me something? King, you wanted to ask me something. You go first. I won't forget my thing, right? Do you ever have that in conversations maybe with your spouse? You go first. I won't forget. And then when it comes to my turn, I'm always like, I have no idea. I totally forgot. But Haman's not going to forget because he's so excited. I really want to go, king. Choose me. Choose me. Let me go. Let me go first. No, no. You're the king. You say your thing first, and then I'll save mine for next. And the king says this to him. What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And because Haman is an egotistical, prideful guy, he says to himself, who would the king want to honor except for me? He wants 
to do something great for me, right? Do you know someone like that where the whole sun, moon, the universe revolves around them? That's Haman. Don't look at them if they're here, but that's Haman in the story. Oh boy, man, the king wants to do something for me and he's asking me what he should do. Now we know Haman already has everything that anyone could ever want, right? He's incredibly rich. He's the second most powerful man of the empire. He's got a big family. He's got all of these things going for himself. And so what does he want? He wants something to stroke his pride and his ego a little bit. He wants recognition in front of the whole city. And so this is the plan that he gives to the king. For the man whom the king delights to honor, me, I know it, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn. And the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor. And let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Right? They don't have Facebook or Instagram to post it. So let's have somebody march this guy through the city that you want to honor. Let's bring him some robes, not just any robes, the king's robes. The king's robes he's already been wearing. So when I get marched through town, people say, hey, aren't those the king's robes? Yeah, you probably recognize these. We share clothes. You know, we're just kind of that close. Isn't that the king's horse? Oh, yeah, we share horses. We're just that kind of, we're that intimate. And have someone lead me through saying, this is the guy the king loves. This is the man the king wants to honor. Everyone come out and see the man the king wants to honor. Haman is just picturing this in his head, and it's going to be so good. There's going to be adoring crowds. He's picturing his wave, right? Very regal and royal. It's going to be so, so good. Then listen to these words. The king says this, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai. Dun, dun, dun. Haman's jaw hits the floor. He's feeling lightheaded. The room is kind of spinning. He feels like he's going to throw up all over his shoes and the king's shoes as well. Who? Do this for what? I was mis- uh, you have to say that again? I didn't quite understand. I think you got the wrong name. I think you meant Haman, but you said Mordecai on accident, right? He's just blown. What do you mean this is for Mordecai? Do this for Mordecai, the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you've mentioned. Do it all. Not only is Mordecai going to get the recognition Haman wanted, but Haman is the one who's going to lead him through the city, announcing how great this guy is. Everything that Haman wanted for himself, Mordecai is about to get. Can you imagine the conversation that happens as Haman goes to Mordecai? Haman hates Mordecai. Mordecai knows it. Mordecai also doesn't like Haman very much, right? Haman just issued a genocide decree to have uh, Mordecai and all other Jews killed. And now Haman shows up with a horse and a robe. Mordecai, put this on. I'm not putting that on. Put this on right now. This is the king's robe. I'm not wearing the king's robe. You put it on and you get on the horse right now. We're going for a pony ride. What? We're doing what? I'm going to lead you through the city and I'm going to shout some good things about you and you just sit there and don't even smile. All right, so Mordecai climbs up onto this horse and then can you imagine how Haman would be announcing this? Behold the man the king wants to honor. You know, trying to keep it pretty quiet and low-key. Mordecai's on the back of the door saying, I can't quite hear you, Haman, a little louder. Behold the man, right? And so people are waking up. This is the middle of the night. It's happened because the king couldn't sleep, so it is late. And so all of this is happening, and at the end of it, Mordecai goes back to work. He says he goes back and he sits at the king's gate where he works. Haman, we're told, covers his head and runs weeping back home. He just wants to be alone. He can't believe how awfully this has turned out for him. And then who's waiting for him when he gets there? All of his friends. All his friends who came up with the plan to build the gallows to hang Mordecai, they've all stayed because they've been waiting to hear the good news. Hey, man, how did it go with the king? He comes in, face all red and blotchy. He's been crying all night. His hood is on. And he can't even talk probably for the first little bit when he gets there. Then he tells him everything that's happened. Everything's gone wrong. Are you going to hang him? I didn't even get to tell him about the hanging. He made me march him to the city on a horse shouting about how great he is. What? So as they talk about this, remember the first time he talked to his friends, they gave him really bad advice. This time, they just make a really clear and accurate statement. And I want to read it for you. They say this, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but surely you will fall before him. Haman, this is not good. This is not good at all. 
You didn't tell us before that Mordecai was a Jew. You're trying to kill all the Jews, and now the king has celebrated him and honored him. Hey, man, this is not looking good at all. Mm -mm. Not good for you, buddy. Remember, in you maybe don't remember the reference. It's uh, Proverbs 16, 18, but you'll remember the statement. Pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before the fall, and no one's prouder than Haman. And his fall is going to be bigger and harder than anyone else. It's still that night. That night that we started with. That night where all those other things have happened. And now his, he and his friends have been oblivious to this. But the night is over. The sun is up. And all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. And it's the king's servant saying, come on, Haman. It's time to go for the feast. Here he is all blotchy and covered in tears and everything else. And he's like, oh my goodness. Now he's got to go. He's got to go celebrate with the king and the queen for one more feast. That night. Ever had a night like that? Ever had a night like this where in Esther, everything's been going so slowly. We're about eight years into the book of Esther, and all of a sudden, all these things start to happen all at once. All these dominoes start to fall, getting faster and faster as they do. I think what we're seeing here is a miracle. And we get confused about miracles. We think that miracles have to be plagues of locusts dropping from the sky or seas being parted uh, right in front of us or dead people coming up from the grave. And we miss that there are also quiet, simple whispers of miracles that happen in our everyday lives. Yeah, this shouldn't really be a miracle, should it? I mean, no one died, no one's raised from the dead. All these things come together. They're all orchestrated together perfectly. So right at the exact right time, all these things happen. Let me, we would say like this, what a crazy coincidence. What a fluke. Can you believe that happened? The Bible says this, don't rob God. Don't say it's a coincidence or a fluke. God did it. Let me read just a few of these things for you or remind you of a few of these things. Like why couldn't the king sleep that night? And why did the servant grab that book and read that sentence about Mordecai? And why did the king sit up and say, we got to do something for Mordecai right now? And why did Haman run right that night to the king to say, we have to hang Mordecai? He was going to see him the very next morning. Why didn't he wait? And why did all of these things happen all at once? Because God was in control. One of the things I love about the book of Esther is we've talked about this before. God's not mentioned, but here you see him so clearly at work. Whose plan is this? It's not Esther's plan. It's not Mordecai's plan. Mordecai has not done something to turn these events around. It's certainly not Haman's plan, and it's not the king. The king is sleeping like a baby right now, and he's dreaming about drinking wine and eating KFC in the morning. This isn't any of their plan or doing. This is God at work. If you look at your own lives, I hope you can look back and see the same thing that God's been at work and maybe it's been quiet, silent whispers in the middle of the night, but God has certainly been doing things in your life as well. It's interesting to think about this story because it seems like everything was going perfectly for Haman. Haman had everything, everything was going according to his plan, but the key word there is was. It all was going perfectly But now that's all changing. Same like we could look at uh, the Jews and Mordecai and say, it looked like everything was going so poorly for them. Everything was unfolding just in the worst way possible. But the same is true. It was. But God has turned that around for Mordecai as well. We're not quite there yet, but in chapter 7, we're going to see what has happened. Everything hinges on this story, and in chapter 7, everything gets reversed. Everything we thought would happen doesn't happen. It all happens in a different way. It all changes. Everything is spun around. It reminds me of this passage from Proverbs 16. Earlier, I read from Proverbs, uh, pride comes before the fall. Just a few verses before that, it says this, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. We come up with all these plans. I mean, some of you have plans for this afternoon. Some of you have plans for the next week. Some of you have got like a five-year, ten-year plan of all these things that you're going to do, and that's great. But if our plans aren't God's plan, then they will not happen. They won't unfold the way that we were expecting them to because God is the one who establishes our steps. God says, yes, it's going to go this way, or no, it won't. How many of you have made a plan and then it didn't turn out the way you thought it would? All of us. We make up our plans, but God establishes our steps. 
If you're being faithful and you're trusting in God and things are difficult right now, if you're struggling, if you're wrestling, then I want you to know that chapter 7 is coming. Chapter 7, where everything gets turned around, is coming. Where all those things that have been so difficult, so challenging, so hard, a change is coming to that situation just like it's coming for Mordecai. In Romans 8, it says this, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I love that verse because I need that reminder sometimes, and I think you do too, that all things, all things, all of the things, all the hard things, all the difficult things, all the good things, all the challenging things, all the obstacles, all the things that kept you up at night crying, all the things you were worrying about, God works all things to the good of those who love him. He even works uh, Haman's plan to kill Mordecai to the good of those who love him. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've been struggling. Maybe you've been wrestling. Maybe bad things are happening to you. That doesn't mean those situations are good. It means God is going to make something good come out of it. You've been getting beat up or lied to or stolen from or whatever it is. That situation is not good. But God will somehow work good through that for you. This entire story pivots, interestingly enough, on a sleepless night for the king. If it weren't for that, it seems like the outcome would be very bad for Mordecai and all the Jews. But everything hinges on and pivots on this one sleepless night. The same is true for you and I. Everything for us hinges on and pivots on a sleepless night in a little town of Bethlehem as the Savior of the world is born. And everything starts to change because of that. And it takes a long time. It takes a long time. People have been waiting thousands of years for this promised Savior to come. It takes a long time as they wait. And it takes a long time as Jesus is born. And then not much seems to happen. First of all, hardly anyone knows about it. Just these shepherds and angels uh, that hear the story and announce it to the people around them. But it's very quiet. It's almost this whisper as the Savior arrives. And as you watch the life of Jesus, it's kind of just going along. He's preaching, he's teaching, he's healing, he's doing miracles, he's doing all these things. But there's, there's action there, but it speeds up as we come to the Holy Week, that last Holy Week as Jesus celebrates the Lord's Supper, as he gets betrayed, as he gets arrested, as he gets beaten, as he gets tried, and as he gets crucified. As we look at all those things, we'd look and say, oh no, something went wrong, it all goes bad, it's all falling apart, but we don't see that God works all things to the good Even the death of his son on the cross, even the crucifixion of Jesus is worked for our good. And sometimes if you give up too soon, if you walk away too soon, you'd miss something so big, like three days later, Jesus rises from the grave, the victor, the champion, the one and only savior of the world. Church, I don't know where you're at in that story, that progression. I don't know if you can see yet how God is working all things to the good. If you can't see it yet, know that it is still coming because God works all things to the good. Jesus is our hope. He's our chance. He's our pivot point. He's our hinge. In our stories, everything should be going badly. In our stories, there should be no hope. In our stories, we're cut off from God if it isn't for Jesus. In our stories, all that we've earned, all that we deserve, we confess this often in the first service, is judgment from God, is uh, eternal separation and damnation from God. But everything hinges and pivots on Jesus, and because he lived and died and rose again for us, forgiveness is ours, and eternal life is ours, and the victory is ours. Church, I hope that you can look back at your life and see a series of miracles. Maybe they're really big things, or maybe they're just quiet whispers where God orchestrates everything for the good of those who love him. If you can't see it there, I hope that you look to the cross and see, oh yeah, God has done a miracle for me here. If you don't look there, then I encourage you to look to the waters of baptism if you've been baptized and say, oh yeah, God did a miracle here where he took someone who was dead in their sins and made them alive in Christ, adopting them as his very own sons. I'd encourage you to look at the altar where we celebrate communion as God comes to us again and again, a miracle, his very own flesh and blood for our forgiveness there miraculously and mysteriously. And if you're struggling and waiting for something to change, know that your chapter seven is coming because God works all things to the good of those who love him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the book of Esther. And I thank you that we can see in it now so clearly that you are orchestrating things 
for the good of those who love you. And God, as we work through that book, it does not look good. It doesn't look like it's going to work out. And yet we see this great transition that all rests on a sleepless night. God, I pray for each one of us here, whatever we might be struggling with, the challenge, the obstacle that we're facing, God, I pray that we'd be able to look and see how you're working behind the scenes. And maybe right now that's hard to see. And so I pray that you'd help us to look back at your faithfulness to us in the past, at all the things that you've done for us, those things we've just talked about, uh, the cross and the empty tomb, the waters of baptism, the Lord's Supper, that we see things in our very own unique and specific lives, how you've uh, influenced decisions or directed our steps. And God, I just pray that we'd see more and more clearly you at work in the day-to-day. And God, as we do struggle, I pray that you'd bring us comfort and hope and peace, knowing that you're the God who loves us, who works all things to the good. Lord, we pray for those people who do not know you, who are far from you. Maybe they have known you, but they've walked away. God, we pray that you would call them back. For those people who have maybe never even heard your name before or known who you are, God, I pray that we would go out with words of life and truth and grace to them and that you'd make a change in their stories as well. God, we love you. We thank you for all the things that you have done for us. We thank you for your incredible grace to us in Jesus. We thank you for your ongoing work in us through your word and the Holy Spirit. We ask you to help us to be faithful to you and that we'd keep holding out hope as we trust in you for the next chapter, knowing that you work all things to the good. For everything else on our hearts and minds, we commit all those things trusting in your Son, Jesus, the one and only Savior of the world. Amen. Receive a blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.